Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Nicola Solomon, the Chief Executive of the Society of Authors. Thanks for joining this event on Comics Creators and Global Pandemic, part of our second Society of Authors Home Festival, our autumn win winter season, a nine week program of online events, which is running until the 10th of December 2020. Most of our events are free, but if you can afford to, please consider donating to our Authors Contingency Fund to support authors in need during the pandemic. Uh, Carlos is going to put a chat for me in the chat box so you can get the link there or look, find it as many things here on our website. Also, do look at our virtual Blackwell store, which features books by authors and speakers in the Home Festival, including our lovely three panellists here. And again, if you buy books from there, a percentage will go to the contingency fund. And finally, don't forget, if you're not yet a Society of Authors member, you can join as a comics creator with 20% off membership using the code COMICS20, which again, uh, Carlotta will be putting in the inbox. We are looking forward to having you today. We hope your connections will be clear, but if at any point you have connection issues, try just pressing the reconnect button, which usually seems to work for most people. If we disappear, we'll try and keep on talking, but uh, we hope it's all gonna work. And we are very lucky to have as our guests this week three comics legends. I'll start with Hannah Berry, comics creator, cartoonist, writer, illustrator, and the current UK Comics Laureate. She's the author of three highly acclaimed and occasionally award-winning graphic novels published by Jonathan Cape. And in 2018, she was inducted as a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. We're also going to put in the chat uh, links to all their Twitter, Instagram, websites, etc. Alan Cowsill is a writer. He wrote Stormwatcher for Acme and Eclipse before spending 10 years as an editor at Marvel UK working on the US titles and Overkill. He was a launch editor for Panini, Panini UK's Marvel reprint line and wrote the first UK originated Spider-Man strips for over a decade in spectacular Spider-Man adventures. He created the best-selling Jackie Chan adventures and the award-winning classic Marvel figurine collection and DC superhero collection for Eagle Moss Publishing. And he presently edits the Marvel movie collection and he's the creator of a podcast called Last Geek in Space, which sounds great. And Woodrow Phoenix is a writer, graphic designer, an artist based in London and Cambridge. His work has appeared in national UK newspapers, magazines and comics across Europe, the USA and Japan, and in television projects for Walt Disney and Cartoon Network. His most recent book, Crash Course, was published in August. And Woodrow is a member of the management committee of the SOA. And both Hannah and Woodrow are on the steering committee of our new Comics Creators Network, of which you'll hear more later. And we are very excited and we hope you will be too. So today's format is a quick intro for me, if that wasn't already a slow intro. And then the panel and I are gonna chat for about 30 minutes and then have about 15 minutes of audience questions. I don't think we've had any questions sent in, but if you've got any questions you want to put in the chat, just put them preferably with a queue in front of them and we'll try to get to them for you. And we're gonna start with an exploration of where comics creators and the comics industry are at the moment. But I'm majorly helped by this because Hannah has undertaken a recent survey on UK comics creators and 623 comics creators completed the survey between the 18th of April and 19th of May 2020. And the anonymized data was produced, was collected and analyzed by the audience agency who then drew up a great report, which I would highly recommend to anybody. You can easily search it by putting Hannah Berry comics creators research report. And it's, uh, as Hannah says, it's the most accurate snap snapshot of the UK comic scene to date. And you said, Hannah, it managed to be both soul destroying and heart heartwarming in equal measure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a proper roller coaster, that. <laughs> and so I wanted to ask you, who took part in the research and what did you learn about the people who are creating comics today? Where was your... So, uh, well, the biggest challenge was to, to make it... Um, but comics is quite a broad church. I really wanted to be able to reach all of the different, you know, areas of comics. So the, the biggest challenge was to try to make sure that everybody responded because otherwise it's sort of redundant. So 
it was uh, there was a lot of me um, emailing and, and asking you know uh, people to, to various different comics journalists and various different comics organizations and very di various different comics publishers and groups to, to try to spread the word to make sure that everybody responded and it was not it, it was not just people who are working in comics it was everybody who's making comics because um, and there's been sort of had a bit of a conversation about this online the idea is that or the thinking is that my thinking, my thinking specifically, is that um, comics is such a hard area to make a living in that if you only class people, if you only consider people who are professionals, then it's, it's not, you're, you're discounting people who would be professionals if this was a, a better funded and supported uh, um, industry, quite on quite industry, because that was, that was the thing, calling it an, in an industry has been picked up on the side, that's a bit, uh, that's, that's a bit of a grand term <laughs> what comics is in the UK. Um, so I would say industry, like like that, like uh, a twat with air quotes. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting, that question about what is the comic industry. And indeed, in introducing you, I was really noticing for the three of you what you call yourself. So Alan calls himself a writer, Hannah calls herself a comics creator, and Woodrow calls himself a, white, a writer and graphic designer. So it must have been hard to pull in all of those people and say, hold on a minute. Are are you even self-identifying as comics creator? That you know that would have been a good question to ask. Well, what do you call yourself? I should have really for the next one in five years' time. I'll 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 do that. But it was so it, fundamentally, it was anybody who makes comics who lives in the UK. That was the that was the the remit. Anybody could fill in if they did that because we we all call ourselves different. And also, we call ourselves different things according to who we're talking to. I mean, if I'm trying to if I'm trying to sound very grandiose, I'll say I'm a graphic novelist. Uh, with that voice as well, that's my, that's my voice. graphic novel voice. <laughs> my graphic novel voice. And would you to professionals? Would you do you struggle with that kind of title and and self identification as a comics creator as well? No, I I call myself a comics creator all the time, but like Hannah says, I do kind of switch that around depending on what I'm talking about because I do lots of other stuff as well, and they're all kind of relevant things. So the fact that I also write. I also do lots of book design and graphic design, and I also illustrate. So, comics creator, graphic designer, kind of covers all those things, really. And Alan, what about you? I think that's right. What Woodrow just said. I'm a writer and editor, so I earn probably about sixty percent of my living from editing these days, and thirty five percent from writing. But other other friends of mine who are artists tend to make more of the money these days from some people doing corporate artwork, and they get a lot of money from that. And that then finances the smaller projects that you know they might make a bit of money from but not enough to live on and that probably takes a bit back to the survey Hannah and what were the most significant findings for you I know that you've you might be sick to death of this because you've also just run a series of four absolutely brilliant <laughs> seminars oh. and talks on on the findings but I still think it's worth just recapping what it was that came out to you as really either surprising or, or, or terrifyingly unsurprising? <laughs> well, I think um, the, the, maybe the most soul-destroying thing was that it, it really uh, confirmed everything that we thought about earning a living making comics in the UK, is the, uh, the, the fact that we, we're not. <laughs> most people are not. I think it was, uh, there was, uh, if, if you say, going, going by different brackets, if you, if you say a decent income is over 20 grand, I think 15% were earning over 20 grand, and then there was 5% that were earning from between 50 grand and 180,000 pounds, which is someone is doing okay out there. Yeah. So there's a tiny, I think it's the same as, as the rest of the writing world, where there's a tiny faction that, that, are, that are doing okay, and then everybody else is just kind of doing it as a sideline, doing it, well, not as a sideline, but doing it um, uh, as. Subsidizing uh, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, having subsidized. I think there was, uh, I say, I think I've got my statistics right here, but there were 87% of, um, of, of comics creators are, are subsidizing their work through other different incomes. So um, it's not that there's very few people who are just making comics by themselves. I think there was one in 10 creators who um, consider it their main source of their, their main occupation, but are doing it only in their free time. So presumably around other work that pays or around other caring responsibilities or other duties. So it's not something it's not like there's many people who can sit down at the start of a working day, work on comics all day and then stop at the end of the day and then continue a normal, healthy work life balance. There's, there's very few people that are doing that. And that's exactly the same as all the surveys we've ever done on writers of, of all types, the ALCS surveys, which show that most people, I think the median um, salaries have been like ten and a half thousand pounds for a full-time professional writer. 
and that almost all of the people were being subsidized by other work or by other household income. The median household incomes were much, much higher. And that was so, so depressing that somehow this is some kind of little hobby, but it isn't mm. real work. Yeah. And, and were there other, but also, but what was slightly different for comics was that bit that you've identified about whether people even feel it's an industry or something that even that they that they could be making a living in? Yeah, I mean, the, the a lot of so there were um, in in the survey as well. There were a lot of uh, literal responses. People were encouraged to fill in uh, literal responses to, to to various questions. And I think what what the audience said was surprising was that they were. 100% of people fill them in, whereas normally there's, you know, they get half of the people fill them in, which, you know, I think it shows that people really care about comics and, and you know, what they're doing. We're interested in the survey. But um, a lot of them were were, um, were were sort of not, well, bemoaning sounds like, like griping, but you know, we're, we're really saying how much they love the comics industry and the comics, stop saying industry, the, the comics community and creating comics, but were just like, just completely stymied by the lack of opportunities, the lack of, you know, ways to get their work out there, the lack of support, the lack of, you know, any kind of infrastructure to be able to to make this into a into a career. Which is again is why I wanted to include people who are just making comics and don't consider it their career yet, because, you know, it, it could be if they, if the right support was there, it potentially could potentially be. That's there's probably less. Um chances now less magazines out there to get your first foot in the business you know mm -hmm. 30 years when i started you still had revolver deadline you know 2000 ad still going but there's a lot more choice of comics to get your foot in the door and then move on from there so that's actually a question is beautifully coming on a question i was really okay. just going to ask do we think that this has got worse or got better so Alan, you think there are fewer opportunities now? I think there's fewer, but at the same time, it's a sort of yin and yang situation. There's probably fewer opportunities opportunities to get a bit of money from a publisher, but it's a lot easier these days to say self-publish, get your work out there and sell it at conventions. And nowadays, well, you know, pre-pandemic, there were conventions every week somewhere in the country. So a lot of artists, even ones who doing a bit of money from comics, would be able to supplement the income by earning decent amounts of conventions doing sketches and artwork the big change i'd say in, in the entire public industry in the uk has been kind of post sort of 2009 2010 when there was that big contraction of magazines um publishing things because when i started out i was doing illustrations for a range of magazines and i was doing comic strips for other for other publishers and there was lots of work to do because there were lots of magazines and probably a third of the magazines now on the newsstand that there were 15 years ago so that's a big big change and those magazines that do exist use use less illustration now the radio times that i started out working for you know used to use like 40 illustrators a week because they had so much stuff in there and if you pick one up now, I don't know if there's more than I don't know, 10 or 12 in an issue, maybe. So that's a big change. And that was weekly. You know. Is that all due to cost cutting, do you think? I think so, yeah. yeah. And the page rates, you know, a lot of the page rates haven't changed that much in 30 years. You know, it's quite scary if you look back from, say, 1990 to now. It's uh, not quite the rate of inflation. So, Alan, when and how did you get into comics? Give us a bit of your journey yep. so we can see. And, and how has that changed over the years? Well, I started back in the indie scene in the mid-80s when I was at college. I sold my first strip to Harrier Comics, this little black and white publisher. I was so naive, I thought I was going to earn a fortune and get a Stratocaster with the royalties. And um, I never earned a penny. You know, we didn't get any money from the first few issues that came out. But it got my foot in the door, it gave me enough connections to um, meet other creators. And that's how comics like Storm Watcher, we did some work for Deadline. Uh, myself, my co-writer Ian Abinet, and an uh, artist, Andrew Curry. We were a little band for a while, sort of breaking into the comic scene, going down to the conventions, chatting to people like Steve McManus, John Tomlinson, all the editors at the time, just trying to sell one-off stories. And slowly, we met more people, my contacts got me a job at Games Workshop as an editor somehow. I'm not sure how, because I had no editorial experience. 
And then that gave me enough editorial experience then to get a job at Marvel later on. And it all starts from you know, meeting people at conventions and making contacts. And Hannah, what about you? Um, I started much later. <laughs> I started in... Um... I am ancient. <laughs> that wasn't where I was going. I was, just, I was just saying, I'm just so young. <laughs> um, I started in uh, 2005. Um, I was working on... I was at art school and I was working on this... Uh, I just, I'd always loved comics and I um, started working on a, on a, I decided to work on a graphic novel. Just, just start on one. Just, you know, just do it. And um, I was phenomenally lucky in that it happened to be um, at a time when uh, Jonathan Cape were looking for, they, they just had a, a couple of successes with, with, um, with graphic novels and they were looking for some more and they were looking for homegrown uh, graphic novels. They've been um, reprinting American ones. And, um, I, so I sent an email, I sent a letter, I think, to, to them and to, I'm going to say Dark Horse, I think it was Dark Horse, and said, no, do you interested in listening to my graphic novel? And um, Jonathan Cape said yes, and so it's sort of been, I can re it's a stupidly uh, stupidly easy way into the into the comics world. But the thing is that I didn't, because I wasn't involved in the community in any way, I didn't really know anybody until my book actually came out. I just sort of didn't know how to get involved. And so it's this weird kind of backwards way of, of meeting everybody, which, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's been, um, I really feel like I, I feel like I belong. <laughs> I hope I belong. But it's, um, I certainly not had the, like the, the, the sort of the, that, um, you know, the, the whole, the whole networking experience, that whole kind of that community thing. I didn't come until a lot later for me. So Woodrow, did you feel that you came in through community or you came in through the work that you were doing for publishers and met the community after, or was it a combination? It was kind of like two interlocking worlds, really, because I started off self-publishing like um, a lot of people that I knew at the time, literally photocopying things and, and selling photocopied comics. And I, my first professional work was actually lettering, because I was always very interested in lettering and typography, and um, I was very good at copying things. And um, Claire Bretisher, French... Um, cartoonist who did amazing comics in the kind of 80s and 90s um her work was was really big in france and um they started to reprint it here in the uk and then they wanted to do book collections of it and some of her work was not had not been um, published in the uk before so it was, had to be relettered and um so my first my first professional job was relettering claire bretichet's books um and that was a really great job to do because you know if you do it really well people have no idea that this person didn't actually redo really their own stuff. Um, so I did that for a while. And then I did more lettering for, for um, 2000 AD and for um, um, Deadline, no, not Deadline. Um, yeah, anyway, lots of UK comic things. And then I, then I started working, I got a job doing Sonic the Comic, drawing the events of Sonic and Tails, and um, did other things like that, just jumping around. And like Anna, Hannah said, one thing I did do is when the Independent on Star Sunday started up, I just saw they had no comics. So I just rang them up and said, would you like a comic for the, and they said, yeah, okay. So I, so I, that was how I did a comic for the independent on Sunday. It, did, it lasted about two months before um, they decided that it wasn't quite what they wanted. But you know, that was two months of national newspaper that was, you know, just for the, just for the going. And that kind of stuff I think is much harder now because people aren't so open, so responsive. But when you still will. recommend to people that they use a bit of chutzpah and uh, identify gaps and, and just that's write what up. I do. Yeah. That's yeah, what I do. Just, just look for look for things that seem like a place you want to work in and think: is there something there I can do? Is there something that I could contribute? And then just offer. You know. Yeah. yeah. Could this be improved with the comic? Yes, it could. Get involved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, most of most of my work has come from calling people. Most of my work has come from calling people and just saying, "Would you like me to do something?" And I have this idea. What do you think? And it's it's most people will entertain it at the very least, you know. So it's always worth trying. So that that gets into how you get something, and, and some of that's things that are published. But you've also self-published. Is there still? Do you think that self-publishing is still a way in? Better, you know, more or less easier, harder. I think it's a, always a good idea to make the thing that you're thinking about rather than wait for someone else to, to, to ask you to do it. Because it's always much easier to sell something that you actually physically have rather than try and convince somebody about an idea that you've got. 
So my own preference is always to make stuff, you know, because I like making things. I like to control that process. I like to make a book from start to finish because I can, you know, I can design things. I can produce things. I know how that works. I know how to talk to printers so I can make the objects that I want to make. So for me, it, it just makes sense to do that. There's also some creators, I mean, uh, Great Time on Kickstarter, they've sort of bypassed traditional comics and um, I've totally forgotten the name with a big success, and I might know it. It's a series about a uh, female science, a young girl who's a scientist in sort of a um, cyber gothic world. Forgot. It's, uh, anyway, it's only in the creator of Fortune. That's all right. <laughs> I should have wrote it down. It's only in Fortune. She's got a great style to it, you know. And, He's on the creator, he's only doing it on Kickstarter, but he's making it. Oh, Carlos will put a link in the chat, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're relying on Carlos. Oh, yeah, I didn't mean. <laughs> it's a great series, it'll come back to me tomorrow, the name of it. But um, that's a really interesting example of someone's bypassed the whole normal, you know, get an agent, get a publisher, and they've gone straight to people. And now it's, you know, it's got a mass. I think it's the last one made 50 or 60,000 for the graphic novel on Kickstarter. And we're finding with the with our advice teams, we're getting from, you know, we, we're doing a lot of advice to comics creators about um, crowdfunding as well as other more traditional contracts. Yeah. It's, it's not at all unusual. But, but one strikes me are two things about the industry. One is how do comics fit into today's publishing industry? Do we think that the big publishers are waking up to the potential of comics or is it still with some small niche and really a kind of parallel universe um do you want to start on that hannah yeah well i i mean if you'd asked me this a, a few years ago i'd have said oh it's increasing increasing there, there's loads of there's loads more publishers who are publishing you know traditional publishers who are publishing graphic novels but i i wonder if it's a a bubble that's starting to shrink due to the the cost and the and the and the I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe there's not the, the the profits coming in. I was um, talking to my editor at, uh, at Cape. Um, well, I emailed my editor at Cape the other day, and you know he's, he's started this 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 big line of, of graphic novels at, uh, within Public uh, Penguin Random House, and uh, he mentioned they've just he's, he's semi retired and they've reduced it down to three titles a year, which is that, that's that's nothing. It's it's sort of like they've they kind of pushed it to one side. Well, you know that's that's your that's your thing. We'll deal with that. You, you deal with that and then it, it's it feels like it's been pushed out I, I don't know if it's really the growth is still i don't think if if you guys feel the same but i'm not sure if the, the boom think, is still booming i think maybe publishers keep looking at probably the european market and think we should have some of that we should do some graphic mm -hmm. novels make millions um egmont i know woodrow myself involved with egmont back in the 90s weren't we they were trying to do an epics line that was um graphic novels aimed at sort of young kids and it was almost successful. It nearly did it, but again, you know, it kind of burnt out after a while. Uh, the thing that is that for publishers realise that actually it takes a lot of money to make graphic novels, mm -hmm. and much more than it does to to make a comparable, yeah. you know, um, textbook. And so that's a one big reason because if, if they're going to spend like four times as much, then they're going to want you know four times as much success with it. And if they're going to spend all that money and just have average sales, then it's like, well, you know, what's the point really? But one other thing, and actually talking to Egmont, but also other publishers recently, really bizarrely that I hear from them is, oh, I'm finding it really hard to find illustrators, you know, writers for graphic novels or for the <laughs> comics or for anything else I'm doing. And it, that's why I use the words parallel universe, because I'm like, I know loads of those people. And I actually, <laughs> and actually said to them, send your request to society authors, we'll share them. But it was, it's almost as if there isn't enough knowledge from the editors and others yeah. in the house to know where to ask or where to start and then how to assess what's sent to them. Is that yeah. all right for, to you? I, well, that's one thing we all find out actually, is that, is that mm -hmm. working with traditional publishers most editors have no idea what we're doing. You know, they yeah. can't they can't understand how comics work or or what's involved in doing them or the mechanics of them. So you're you're kind of working in a vacuum. You know, you produce this stuff. Well, I'm sure Hannah can talk about that too. Um, you produce this stuff, you hand it over, and they kind of go, "Yeah, yeah, looks okay, fine." <laughs> I've, I've checked the spelling. <laughs> I had a case of that years ago. I was um, going through the final uh, production briefs of a graphic novel I'd done. And the double page spread was in the wrong place. It was going over the page. 
So, you know, one half was there, the other half was on. I said, yeah, you should probably put that on my double page spread. Oh, <laughs> my heart sinks, isn't it? I know. Yeah. And I that's not even... Well sorry, sorry, lettering as well for traditional publishers. I don't... Sometimes they don't quite get what an art lettering is and how much mm -hmm. it can add to the graphic novel, you know, comic experience. I wonder as well if they're, if they're not able to find um, creators because they're relying a bit on, on agents. And there's not really yeah. many agents that represent comics people. I mean... Yeah. Um, there's very there's very few that sort of actively looking looking mm. up looking for you know, we were really shocked when we had uh penguin random house come and talk to us last year which about reversions but uh the, the thing that came out was said to us was we acquire 75 percent of the work we publish from the set probably 10 firms of agents that we work with and it's like that is so shocking <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so everybody in the audience, just send just send work directly to editors. Just send it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, even if the thing is, I you know I was on a slush pile. If even if you're on the slush pile, you know, without an agent, if you're completely unsolicited, there's still it's still it's visual. They'll be able to look at it quickly and say, oh, graphic well. Well, when I was it? when I was at Marvel UK, I was editing um, a kids comic, Biker Mice from Mars. And I asked one of my old mates, Paul Birch, to send him some send in some story ideas. He was a writer, but for some reason I've never quite worked out. He used some uh, pencils from Mike Perkins, old pencils on the back of his scripts. And I couldn't use Paul's ideas at the time, but I really needed an artist. And I said, Who's that mate of yours? You know, Mike Perkins, send it, get him to send some stuff in. He got some work with those, and now he's drawing Captain America, Superman and and that was just because one of his friends used some of his old folk copies to put his scripts on. Amazing. But also, I, and Mark Abnett made a comment here, which um, there were estimated 1.21 billion sold in the US and Canada last year. And, you know, France is huge. Japan is, is huge. And you said we're looking over to Europe and saying, why can't we do a bit of that? So the answer is, why can't we do a bit of that? Why are comics considered so niche and small in the UK and so vast in other places in the world. Uh, um, Hannah, what do you think? You've got a view on this. Are you going to make it all vast over, overnight? <laughs> we just we just solve it. We'll just solve it. After this, after this discussion, we'll fix it. Um, I think, I mean, it's a lot of the problem, I think, is the way that, that comics are perceived. I mean, maybe yeah. because children's comics were so successful in the UK, for so many years, and I wonder if that has um, sort of coloured the view of it that that now people will only see comics as being for children. You know, even now, even though even now when there's barely any comics available for children to read, I wonder if that's that's still you know that that pervasive idea is is still what's blocking the idea of comics being for everybody and on every subject and and you know by everyone. Yeah, it's definitely a ideal with people in this country that they're just being old dandy and superheroes. Mm. And there's not all. Not, I think it's changing. I think it's a younger generation coming up who are more into exploring what's out there. Now, Godson doesn't like superheroes. He doesn't like you know traditional comics, but because he knows I'm in the business, he's asking me for some recommendations for you know what he called proper graphic novels. Which was yeah, it's quite hard to. I think if you're not involved directly in comics, it's quite hard to investigate and see what is out there. I mean, if you if you stroll into a Waterstones, for example. Other bookshops are available. If you stroll into into you know a, a bookshop and and you know you, you feel like you want to read some sci-fi, you'll go to the sci-fi section. You can't do that with the graphic novel section because everything is just lumped in together. You can't really explore it in the same way and find things that are interesting to you. It's a bit I, I think one of the points was really made on your previous talk, talks that like it's not a it's not a section; it's a medium. So you yeah. can do yeah. anything with comics. <laughs> so shoving them all together doesn't actually yeah. help it's, anyone buy yeah. one. No, it's that's very a bit silly. like shoving everything together in the bookshop under writing, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All the red books I'll put over here. <laughs> and Woodrow, do you have any thoughts on that and and why it's it's more niche here than in some other places? How long have you got? <laughs> it's like, well, we've got another thirty minutes. No, I think partly it's uh, it's just the way things have evolved over the last 50, 60 years. But it's also partly because the population thing has a very big part to play in this. If you think about how many people there are buying any kind of printed material in the UK compared to other countries, it's like you know you can you can survive in the US or in France or in Japan. Um, 
on the sales from 0.5% of the population, because that's still like six or seven million people here in Britain. That's a very much smaller number. So you can be very, very niche, and your sales are going to be in the couple of hundreds, hundreds rather than a couple of thousands. And that's the difference between being able to make a living from it or not. So we are kind of constrained by our geography to some quite large extent. But it is also, isn't it, about bookshops stocking? I think there was a statistic given that something like 12% of the bookshop sales in France are graphic novels or comics. And that's, a, you know, that's huge, whereas that's many bookstores mm -hmm. don't even have a space for comics of any kind. No. Yeah, it's sort of a grudging afterthought. I did, yeah. um, I think I might have, I think I said this on a, one of the talks, I did try to approach Waterstones with the idea of rearranging some of their, just, just a few key graphic titles in different sections. So people who are going to look at, you know, travel, will see that there are some travel graphic novels, for example. And people on the shop floor that I spoke to were really, were really keen on the idea. But then I, I sort of emailed the head office, or lo the local branch, and there was no reply. So I emailed the head office, and there was no reply. And I even managed to get an email to James Daunt to say, hey, I've got an idea for you. Uh, he did not reply. So, I mean, well, if, James, if you're if you're listening, if you're listening to this conversation, please reply. <laughs> oh, well, we should try. James normally replies if we write him. Um, and then the question, is, uh, as bearing in mind, we did to say we talk a bit about the pandemic, and we're trying to keep away from the pandemic. Although they have said today that they found yeah, a vaccine. Thing, so maybe yeah. we won't ever talk about the pandemic news. again. Yeah, <laughs> unless you're a press reporter. news. Um, yeah. So, Kavan Scott said, I think there's been a benefit in the pandemic. It's opened up opportunities to talk to folk in the US comics scene that you would only usually be able to meet at US conventions. But now through Zoom and so on, the industry's got more used to chatting online and homeworking. In a way, it's lowered boundaries as well as raised them. What do each of you think about that? Or are we just all feeling a bit rose tinted today? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've not been to a Zoom convention yet, so it's on my to-do list. Isn't the um, Lakes doing one? Was that gone? Yeah, the Lakes was a couple of weekends ago, and it's all still yeah. online. And then yeah. Top Bubble is this weekend. Yeah. And what do we think? Do you think it? Do you think it'll help with things, Hannah? I mean, I, I, I wanted to say when um, you know when we were talking about Kickstarter earlier, I think that really the the fact that there are no conventions and everything is now online at the moment, and you know, has to be online. I think that's really helped kickstarter um, campaigns because people yeah. are, you know, looking for these, looking for these these things wherever they can. And it's so it's online, so the that's the best way to reach people. And yeah, I mean, I think I think Kevin's got a great point that it's it's, it's sort of shrunk the international boundaries as well. That um, I mean, I I would sort of be interested to see what happens when we can go to conventions again, if this is kind of maintained, it seems like a really healthy way forward. I mean, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe this is, I'm feeling a bit overly optimistic this week, but it does feel good. Well, publishing's had quite a good pandemic in a way. It's a lot of publishing houses. I know we've, the sales have gone up during the pandemic because people have been stuck in reading books. Nice. A friend who does a comic called Storytime, that's a magazine aimed at young kids, some educational thing for homeschooling. And they've done. A, they had a great time. They were doing okay, but suddenly, when suddenly everyone wanted to, you know, teach the kids at home, they were all desperately looking online for something to read to their kids. And then they come across my mates' magazine, and there we are. I mean, I think that the answer is that that publishing has had a better pandemic than creators, yeah. because as we know from the contingency fund, what it's done is affected different people differently so people who are already mega um sales are getting even more mega sales because they're e more easily discoverable people who would be hand sold by bookshops or who rely on appearances have done very much worse so so mm -hmm. you know it is interesting that when we talk to publishers about the contingency funds they don't understand the problem because yeah. they haven't personally had the loss in the way that many many individual writers creators whatever have uh, what do you think, Woodrow, on whether the pandemic is going to do anything good for us? Well, personally, I've had two books kind of shelved, um, so that hasn't been very good for me. Um, other things are coming along to take their place, maybe, but certainly in the short term, things are a lot less good than they would have been without the pandemic for me at the time of year. Um, but I'm lucky I still have others to have other works too, so that's fine. But So I do think 
individual creators are probably having problems because most people I speak to have had work either pushed back or not available at all. And we're all kind of finding that we're having to find other ways to get around that. Um, but yes, I think as if you have a channel already established, then as Alan says, and that's really good because people know where to look for it. Yeah. And what do we think that the industry and comics creators will need to survive? So this isn't quite the same as how do we make it bigger, but also how do, because as I said, there is that dichotomy between what the what, what's good for the industry and what's good for individuals, not least questions people have been asking page rates, for example. Mm -hmm. What do we think yeah. people need to actually allow them to make a living out of this and have it as not just fun? And indeed, uh, I remember that one of your people in your survey said, I love comics, the medium, I love comics, the community, and I'm not as fond as com of comics, the industry. Um, you know, <laughs> what do we do to make the industry fun as well? Hannah, you've looked at the survey and you've had these four talks, so probably it's for you to start with what you think would make yeah. it better. Um, I mean, I think it, it feels like we are... It feels like we have the the I hate the word content, but it feels like we have the content we're putting. We we have the the work that we're that we're making, you know, that we're publishing and self publishing and putting online. And it, you know, the creators are there, the talent is there, the skills are there. It's just that we don't have the readership. We're largely selling to each other, and we we don't really have the the means to increase our readership so much. It's quite. It does feel. I mean, you mentioned uh, you, you asked where where comics sits in amongst. Um, the greater publishing world it does still feel like there's a there's a very big sort of impermeable barrier that you know we can't reach these other readers and it i so that each of the talks that, that i did they were they were themed about different around different issues that the survey um sort of uh um found and so there was the, the lack of lack of money big one uh lack of uh, access to the quote-unquote industry lack of audience and lack of professionalism and i think the lack of audience one that sort of that through the discussion that felt like that was the the real stumbling block that's where it was all falling down that we, we that's where the, the the process was kind of um hitting a wall um but i mean i'd be interested to know what what you guys think well i, I did say this um at one of your survey well, you talks <laughs> but i but i think one thing is that when we kind of confuse a couple of different things to be and they're not really the same because lack of readers is partly to do with what you're writing about. Um, people have this perception that comics are about fantasy subjects. They're about elves and they're about sorcery and they're about spaceships and they're about superheroes and you know they're about stuff that has no real connection to the world. Whereas if you write about sports or transport or wildlife or you know ships or something, then there are a lot of people who like that stuff and who buy those things. A lot of this kind of big, big surprises in the comics publishing world have been people who have been tackling those kinds of subjects that have a bit more um, interest for people who don't, who aren't into fantasy. So that is part of the issue. It's like, it's not just that comics themselves are, are some thing people don't want to engage with. It's also what we're writing about. That's the case when we, when some of these sort of um, less superhero -y comics are adapted for the big screen, it suddenly takes people by surprise. It was based on a graphic novel. And of course, then you have to explain that you know, there are comics out there that don't just have people punching each other in costumes. I mean, you not that there's you anything can. wrong you with that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. You don't have to. No. Yeah, there was uh, in the survey, I asked what people, um, what kind of subjects people were writing about, what genres, and uh, it, overwhelmingly it was sci fi and fantasy. But I think, I feel like that's partly because of the way that we, the way that the survey was set up to sort of put, make people put it in boxes. I mean, the, the the nature of comics i think the way that we approach it is to, to you can because it's so open you can throw in these sort of slight fantastical elements to a real world situation um like the, that first graphic novel that i mentioned that was that was published straight out of art school that was it was sort of a noirish detective story it was very sort of traditional in its style except that one of the characters was a talking tea bag and that was just like a tiny just a tiny fantastical element you, you can only really get away with in comics. And I think we, we just sort of have this um, like this this uh, ability to just to slightly throw in more fantastic. It doesn't necessarily mean it is fantasy and sci-fi, but just to have these kind of uh, slightly otherworldly elements that we put into regular real-world stories. 
Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying fancy is a bad thing. You know, my, oh, my no, no, one of my biggest things was you know pants ant. There's an ant who wears giant robot pants. You know, we made a cartoon out of that for <laughs> Cartoon Network. You know, it's like I'm very happy to do unrealistic stuff. I'm just saying there are there's a whole area that isn't really being touched by comics creators because they doesn't they don't see it as being well. They're not interested in it, which yeah. is fine. But you can't expect people to come to you. You have to go to them if you want to if you want to make stuff. Yeah, no, sorry. I just, I, I was, I was suggesting that maybe this, this fantasy sci-fi element was, was putting people off who didn't realise that it's not that they are very real world stories, but they do have this like slightly, yeah. the slight mm. twist to it because you don't really get that so much in, uh, in other mediums. Mm. And, and Tim Belcher said, you know, we publish non-genre comics, but Soaring Penguin Press find it hard to sell these to comics fans, and yet it's even harder to reach readers who enjoy those type of books who aren't comics fans already. And he finds it a bit of a catch-22. So, uh, so you know, he said it feels like comics readers are only interested in genre titles and the non-genre and the other people, the type of audiences, when you talk about medical comics or whatever, who are used to reading, I don't know, medical textbooks, have no almost mental vocabulary to to see it in comic form. So, so it, and long game, I think, is what's being said in the oh. chat. Mm. So not not at the end of this conversation. Mm. Maybe in, in, next week. Next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll pencil it. <laughs> but also, it's I think that we don't have this tradition of people graduating anymore because when newspapers were the kind of thing that everyone bought one and every newspaper had five or six strips in it people were used to reading comics all the time because they would they would look at them you know they didn't give it any thought it was just something they looked at so it was much easier to sell these compilations of comics um newspaper strips on on, on the back of those and now that people are not reading newspapers anymore there are web comics around which take on much of the same function but again because they tend to be mostly in the area of fancy stuff it's people who are already interested in those things who are reading those Rather than just general public, so the general public is losing its comics literacy because you're not, they're not being yeah. exposed to comics sort of, you know, as as a product of something else, you know, connected yeah. to something else. They have I to think so. seek them out, and so they're, yeah. they're just not. And Kev Sutherland asked if anyone had any other tips on selling books during the pandemic. He said he recently got talked through Amazon promotions, probably set up a series of ads, and since then hadn't sold a single copy. It's tough. Facebook adverts are quite good. If you're self-publishing, though, as well, or if, in a way, I think to make money from that side, you need to write a series, almost like a, not the Jack Reach, I'm not saying you have to write thrillers, but in that sort of way where you've got the main character reappearing in several books. So you then plan it out via Facebook ads or something like that, so you can get a mailing list together, and then you can sell that, your next book to that mailing list. And I think that's the way to grow your business if you're going down that route. It's very hard just to do a one-off title, I think. Do you do you yeah, make things for, for work things, for sort of selling, selling work? Or um, I know Egomoss are doing really well with their advertising online because they yeah. used. To, um, run, I went to Partworks after Marvel, and for years Partworks had a very traditional way of selling the magazine. You should see the adverts, you know, at Christmas and August when TV advertising was cheap. You know, mm -hmm. build the castle in sixty issues or something like that. But when we did the uh, Marvel movie magazine, the other figurines, we started selling online for the first time through Facebook ads, directing your advertising you know, straight to the fan base. And again, building up a list of clients and potential people who are going to fans who are going to buy the book. And as a creator now, if you can get to conventions when they start again, that's another way of building up a list like that. Anyone who buys a book off you at a convention, get their email. I, yeah, I've got I've got a mailing list for this uh, for the survey and subsequent bits and pieces, and I just feel bad using it. It's like, oh, they don't want to hear no, from me. No, just be careful, oh. all of you. Quick warning: if you're asking people if you can take their email, you have to make sure that you are. Oh, yeah. You can use it for marketing purposes. Yeah. Otherwise, you've got a big GDPR issue. Yeah, you? true. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, which leads me on to one of the things that you came back for your survey was. People who are having difficulties, not just with selling, that was one of the big areas, but also about representation, professionalism, how to learn the skills, not the, the writing and drawing, but also the business skills, and also about how to connect and, and networks. And, um, and well, we thought we might do something about that. So I don't know if either Hannah or Woodrow wants to talk a bit about the comic network. Woodrow, you go on. Well, um, it's one of these things over the last, I don't know, five or six years, 
particularly, but certainly over the last 15 years, um, as more and more people have started working in the book publishing area rather than in the comics publishing area, um, there is a quite a different way of working because comics publishers don't use agents. They tend to work with people directly. They don't negotiate. They just give you a rate and that's it. You do it. It's much more of a um, top down scenario where you work for them. Whereas working in traditional publishing, you know, you're working with a publisher rather than for them. And that's a big difference. And also the representation is very different because people tend to have agents to negotiate for them. And, you know, you don't just take what you're giving. You, there's little backwards and forwards, like, how much am I going to get? Can I get this? What about these rights? What about those rights? The kind of conversations that you don't have with the comics publishers. So all that, I think, leads to a very different way of looking at yourself and your work and thinking that this is something that you own and something that um, you are sharing with somebody and that you both deserve to get something out of this and that kind of equity of rights is very important i think to yourself as a professional because it means that you're building a career that's based on stuff that you've that you've made and it's going somewhere um so as more and more people are doing this now are getting books with publishers who are not just comic publishers i think it's time for us to think about ourselves as authors and not just as people who make comics and so with that in mind you know having people who are making comics joining the SOA, we thought it would be a good time to just do something about networking so that all these people who are now working in publishing um, worldwide, nationally, doing things that are comics related can have somewhere to talk about what they do. Because as we know, comics is quite technical. There's lots of stuff involved in making comics that people who don't do it don't understand. And um, it's good to talk about these things with somebody who knows you know, what you're doing. So hence the Comics Creators Network which we're launching on the SOA um, today, actually. And it's gonna be a place for people who make comics or um, to talk about what they do. And that involves not just people who are writing them, but also people who are drawing them and editors who work on them, um, production people, anybody really in the area of comics, who is also a member of the SOA as well. That's the thing. Um, and right I now, think it's just worth yeah. saying that when we started talking about comics, we couldn't believe how many comics creators we already have as members or one way or the other and how much expertise there was in the contract team for advising those people. But again, it comes together with a kind of confidence in the whether you can call yourself an industry or not, that our feeling is that comics creators fight, feel themselves very isolated. Whereas actually, you're not very isolated. You're more mainstream than you think you are. And to have the network makes that easier. <laughs> Sorry about that. Maybe using the wrong word. <laughs> well, I don't believe there is an industry in this country. I'd, I'd call it like an area of production because the industries exist in France and Japan yeah. and the USA. And because we work for those places, you know, we, we are part of those industries. But in the UK, there is no such thing, really. Um, so I think an area of production, I think, kind of, you know, that's a, a quite reasonable way to, to describe you know, what we do, you know, because that's what it is. That's so unsexy, though. <laughs> 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 so, Han, do you want to add anything about the comics creators? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just really uh, excited about the, the possibility of being able to um, join, a, have, have a sort of a... Um, a say as creators in what happens in the area of industry. And wait, what was the phrase? I've forgotten it already. Area, area of, production. Area of production. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It is unsexy. It's gone straight yeah. from my brain. Mm -hmm. um, to, to have some kind of uh, um, to, you know, to not to not be seen as sort of disposable and replaceable, and and you know have that that sort of that to be able to have I, I guess a feeling of self worth collectively and individually in in what we're producing because it it is important what we do. We you know these are. These are good things that we're making, and we're not, we're not, we're not scum. How dare you? <laughs> and, no, um, literally, nobody is saying that. This is just me, just an insight into my own mind. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And somebody um, had asked us whether we should be, you know, negotiating for trying to set rates. And I just wonder, Woodrow, and I know that Hannah's been asked this question, but he's been going, "We're not going to tell you." But do you want to talk a bit about what you and I have been doing with Nobrow over the last few months? Well, this is something that. Um, is proof of the power of a union really because the SOA has has um, legal powers to audit publishers um, so when I saw all this stuff that was happening with um, no brow and um, people who work with it and the all the stuff about contracts and all the terrible things that have been happening I thought rather than just getting annoyed about this we should actually do something about it 
So I asked Nicola and the contracts team of the SOA to contact Nobra and say, we'd like to see your contracts because maybe we can help you improve these things. And Nobra sent them through. We had to look at them. We advised them in all the areas where there were, there were terrible, terrible things in the contracts they could fix. And they fixed most of them. And, and we're in a situation now, I think, where we've got them to really change their working practices, or well, at least it looks like they might do, based on what they've given us in terms of paper, to make um, their contracts a lot fairer for people who work for them. So that's something that we, I, we couldn't have done that without a, a body like the SOA to get them to do that. Because obviously, if you just went to them as an individual and said, hey, I don't think what you're doing is very good, what are they going to say? <laughs> Who cares what you think? You know? I mean, they were really good about. They really were prepared to engage on the like contractual terms model, and uh, we did have a lot of conversations around what do you think clause twelve one d should say. But it's you know it means that everybody who goes to Nobrow will now get offered a better contract. And in particular, we've uh, also found some things around the ways that they calculate things, which means that people will actually get more money. We we can't we cannot set rates per se. That's uh, considered anti-competitive but but we can really talk to them about how to make things better and that's been great and also any publisher we go to and do that knows they're being watched in future and that's really helpful I think. yeah so so I'm, I'm really pleased that we could achieve that because that's going to be a, a big difference to you know all those people who are making who are making books for them who in the past might have felt really agreed about what they were doing but had no real way to do anything about it I mean, that, that's one of the biggest issues, I think, in publishing anyway, is that when people who work in isolation don't realise just how much they're being exploited when they do find out. It's like, what can I do about it? Nothing. Because they've signed these contracts that are terrible. They didn't know they didn't have to sign them. They didn't know how to, how to negotiate them. And when you're part of a body like this, then you have those people around you who can tell you these things. I mean, it's, it's, it is, OK, it's anti-competitive to discuss um, how much people should pay each other. But when you're a creator, sharing those bits of information about oh, this person makes this much, this publisher pays this much. That's not anti competitive that's just understanding the market you're working in. That's a quite a different thing. And, uh, and of course, you know, we in the contracts teams get really upset if we see contracts that go, I've signed this and it's like, why didn't you come to us before you signed it? Because that's what they're for. And I think, Hannah, you were really good about saying like, that was the first thing you did when you... Um, that was the best piece of career advice I'd ever been given. I had a, um, a tutor at, at, um, at art school who was who was like, what's the, is it the Ross Society well, Literary Fund? One of those guys? Anyway, but he was so he was sort of there in case any of the art students wanted to do any writing. And so he knew his yes. stuff and he Royal literary said, no, so which one is it? Royal Literary Fund, do it. Royal Literary Fund, yeah. They don't like coming to people. <laughs> We need to work on them. That's another story. Um, but they, uh, yeah, he, he, he said that in the moment you get any kind of, any contract at all, sign up with the with the SOA because the, they will help you through it. And it's been, I, I tell everybody this because the, the number of people, especially in comics, the number of people that I see that have received contracts and it's like, yeah, contract, and they're about to sign. It's like, no, no, you don't know what's in this. You're not signing up with bloody Vodafone. This is so much <laughs> more than that. There's, there needs to be a conversation that happens. This is not just, you know, I'm working for you now. Here's everything. That's not the end. And I have, I mean, I'm, I'm really well. I've had a really fortunate route in. I've, I've been supported by the SOA the entire way. So I'm really, I'm really lucky in everything that I've had. And so I, I try to sort of share that around, I guess. So I try to, to let other people know that this is, you know, that you, well, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky in that I know that I've had value, I guess. And I try to let other people know that, yeah, you have value as well. You're not sub, you're not just a sub, subordinate in this situation. You're not, you know, you don't need to count out and be grateful and say, oh, thank you. I will, will do all of the work for you and you can have all of my rights. That's not how it that's not how it works. You can have some of the rights. Hmm. But this isn't just publishing. Though. This, this is all creative industries. It's music, it's yeah, TV, yeah. It's, it's everything. You know, people are so grateful to, to get work. They just, when the contract arrives, they just sign it because mm. like, well, thank God I've got a job, you know. Yeah, because and, there are so many more people to... creating than spaces for people to create. Yeah, yeah. Mm, and but... you have to be able to think about that. You have to think about okay, so if somebody wants something I've got, that means it's worth something. So maybe I should just make sure that I'm going to get a fair amount for this. But we, but we have this this way of feeling a bit insecure, like I don't really want to yeah. make a big fuss here because they might just withdraw it and go somewhere else. Mm. And some publishers do do that you know particularly in the comics area it's like if you make a fuss then they say oh well we'll just employ someone else see ya 
you yeah. know so and people don't want to risk losing out so they're not going to make a fuss and we yeah, we know that. with comics, you're really powerful because after all, we've just been saying you can, actually can do it by crowdfunding. You actually can do it by self-publishing. So, so you're needed by the publishers much more in a way than you need the publishers, and it's really important that people have that confidence. Mm. And perhaps we should talk briefly because we're getting actually ridiculously near the end in no time whatsoever about the fact that we're also going to do a few, hopefully, a series going forward of some quite skills-based talks that. Uh, well, I should probably start. So we thought we'd, we'd in December, and you'll watch on our space, we'll do more. We'll do something about, quite literally, the law and the practice around using characters. What are the rights in characters? How can you protect them? How can you use other people's? And about if you write about real people, if you do cartoons, et cetera, what are the, what are the pitfalls? What are the things you should look out for? So we thought this would be a fun start on a series um, of six, hopefully doing some of the things with the Comics Museum. And, Look out for I, I'm more disappointed that when you first talked about this, you said you were going to be doing a talking character, and I really, I really thought <laughs> it was going to be, you know, some kind of costume or. No, well, I could put my costume on, but yeah, that uh, could still happen. I think that could still happen. You know. If you want me to do it in costume, I can <laughs> do that. For the comics community, it would be really yeah. beneficial. <laughs> Actually, a great line from Ed first, and I'm going to raise it now because I know the winning then and. And I'm going to ask you, one, you can be thinking about this while I read his comment. What tips would you give to fellow comics creators? And Ed first says, freelancers are usually a bit funny about money. It's important to be assertive and act as though you're worth it, respectfully, of course. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So, and I know that Woodrow believes in this because we did a talk together about asking. And actually, he, I remember we doing talking about that dance where you're like, Wait, nobody really knows what anyone's thinking about. So you're trying to work out where they're thinking before you. Think. Oh, yeah. It's like, what's the budget? How much have you got? Well, what are you going to spend? Well, how much can you do it for? Well, how much long is it going to take? Well, I was thinking about this much, and nobody wants to name a figure first. The first person to say a figure, you know, loses. And it's, it's so tiring. <laughs> so I'm going to ask each of you for a tip that you would give to a fellow comics creator, other than obviously join the SOA and join our comic network, which is going to tell you everything you would ever need. But um, Alan, should we start with you? Yeah, um, well, two, the contracts are really important. Just going, there's some nightmare stories of young creators developing their own titles and suddenly finding out that they don't own their own title anymore and they're having to fight, you know, to get that title back of some slightly dodgy small publisher. Um, and the other one is to network, to keep meeting people, whether it's via Zoom or you know, Society of um, Authors or whatever you can. You know, We used to do it down the Westminster Arms pub after the um, comic conventions. There's always a way to meet these people. And usually they're pretty good people in comics. And uh, Woodrow, what would you I would say um, trust your own instincts about what's interesting to you. Most of the best successes I've had have been from just doing things that I thought were interesting, whether anybody else thought they were interesting or not, and then trying to sell them later. And also, like I said before, if you see an interesting book or magazine or paper that you want to work for and you can see a gap there, then contact them and just say, I've got this thing. What do you think? And Hannah? Um I think so. One of the things that came out of the survey was, especially in the light of the pandemic, was the, the sort of the stress on mental health. And I think that like the, that work life balance is quite it can be yeah. quite uh, quite work about work uh, heavy when, especially when you're working in comics and you're doing it in your free time. And I I really wish that I'd earlier on in my career I'd paid a lot more attention to the signs of burning out and just being able to. I know it's really hard to do, but sort of to to say to yourself this is it's time to step away from this at uh, this moment because because horror and <laughs> break down the ways yeah. so that I, I guess take your own health and mental health seriously that's a really good point so it's a very it can be a very solitary experience like mm. any like writing can or art can but you've got to be careful you have that balance yeah and, and I it, think helps, it helps it helps to work with people actually <laughs> yeah. because most people are working yeah. by themselves in their bedrooms or in their studios. You know, if you can work with other people, then that's always a really good way to help you balance yourself out because you don't feel you don't feel quite so isolated. Um, obviously, that's yeah. much harder to do for most people, especially now. But I mean, I worked in the studio for most of my professional career, and I really like that a lot—being around other people who are doing what you're doing. Yeah, 
it feels less like some kind of weird vocation. It feels more like a job, yeah. and that's a good thing. And I think maybe you're able to look after other people more than you're able to look after yourself as well. That you're able you're able to see in other people when they're struggling. Be able to recognise that more quickly than than yeah. you would in your own life. I think that's really important on mental health. I think it's also important. That's another great thing about the network is that speaking to other people who do the same things and therefore tell you that actually this is quite normal and it goes through can also be really really helpful so we're hoping it's another thing the network might be helpful for but it's it is really lonely and you know hard to remember that and again we were talking about for the pandemic even harder for many people because you can't get up many people can't get out and do that exercise thing that they were regularly doing which also helped them calm down a bit and you know mm. it doesn't cut it for everybody so yeah i think that's really really important i cannot believe that we've run out of time and i probably ought oh. to let we probably ought to let this nice audience go because it's been so useful but thank you to all of you it's been really interesting and really useful and for sharing and hopefully we can just you know keep on talking about all the millions of questions that we didn't quite get to at this point. But, but I think we said we got through one question, maybe, didn't we? Or maybe two? <laughs> no, we did go through them. I, just, I so subtly wove them in that you didn't know. Okay, ah. you're so skillful. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like, That's the true, yeah. the true professional way you yeah. see it, so smooth. Really We've done so many of these now. Amazing. And also, thank you, Hannah, for your work on the survey and as I love it, because I think this has been. <laughs> Incredibly, I was, I was going to say it's a pleasure, but it, it wasn't. For so giving people a sense <laughs> it's of, of, of many things that be yeah. useful and for working on. And uh, yeah, and I'm going to, if I can do this right, I'm going to thank all of you. I'm going to eject you from the panel. Thank Carlotta, who's been a fantastic moderator. Thank you for everyone who listened in. I remind you that all our sessions are free, but if you can afford to donate a few pounds to the Authors Contingency Fund, to support authors in financial difficulty, please do. Uh, don't forget to buy the books from the bookshop. This week's afternoon tea on Thursday is going to be with Ian Rankin, and we have loads of other fabulous events coming up, so keep watching online on our events page and sign up for them there. Um, and, and the SOS Comics Network is on its own page on the SOS website. Yes, so and, uh, and if you're not yet a member of the Society of Authors, you can join with a 20% discount if you use the code Comics and uh, we'll also be putting up details of our events we'll be doing if you want to you see we're keeping you completely busy this is why we just want to make sure you feel so connected that you don't know what to do with yourself uh, we can continue the conversation on Twitter and the festival hashtag is, is hashtag SOA at home and that's it folks thank you so much thank you yes, thanks Bye. 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 Bye.